Let's get warmed up for Biochem 14. First question, describe what light reflexes will be seen in both eyes if the right optic nerve is damaged prior to the pretectal nucleus. So this is also known as an afferent pupillary defect. So when you shine light into the right eye, there's no constriction of either the left or right pupil. But when you shine light into the left eye, both pupils constrict. Next, what are the major ECG changes seen with a myocardial infarction? So you can see ST segment elevation of at least one millimeter in two contiguous leads. You can see T-wave inversion, you can have a new left bundle branch block, you can have new Q-waves, so Q-waves that are at least one block wide or a third of the height of the total QRS complex. But remember, you only see these changes about 50% of the time when a patient's having an MI, so just because the ECG is normal doesn't mean you can rule out an MI. And the last one, what are the clinical features of neuroleptic malignant syndrome? So you're going to see delirium and mental status changes early on, you can see autonomic instability like tachycardia, then you're going to see muscle rigidity, myoglobinuria, and hyperpyrexia. Okay, let's move on to the lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to our step one video on amino acids and nitrogen. You won't need a bunch of tryptophan to sleep through this lecture. Ha ha ha, I kid. Amino acids are fascinating, what with all the pathways and the enzymes and the cycle things. Woohoo! Okay, go get some coffee or maybe an energy drink or that totally legit methamphetamine that your doctor gave you for your intermittent attention problem. Yeah, I know what's going on. All right, so let's talk about some proteins. Let's talk about amino acid metabolism. So your enterocytes in your gut can absorb very large proteins. Those proteins have to be broken down into individual amino acids in the gut, and then those smaller amino acids can then be absorbed. However, the gut can actually absorb dipeptides and tripeptides, which is a good thing to know. So let's talk about these amino acids. First, what is an essential amino acid? What are these? And what does it mean to be essential? Are they more important? Well, not really, but the essential amino acids are the amino acids that need to be acquired through the diet. We can't synthesize these. We have to eat them. Now, a great mnemonic for the essential amino acids is Private Tim Hall. So the Private uh, Tim Hall uh, mnemonic, so the private is PVT, and then TIM for Tim, and then the uh, big H, little a, because we don't have any A's there, and then two big L's, and that's going to be the mnemonic there. So for the P, uh, it's going to be phenylalanine. The V in private is going to be valine, and the uh, T is going to be threonine. And then when we get to Tim, uh, the T is going to be tryptophan, I is isoleucine, and the M is methionine. And then for the hull, the H is histidine, and then the two L's are going to stand for leucine and lysine. All right, so now this brings us to the concept of acidic versus basic amino acids. So let's talk about the basic ones first. So lysine and arginine are particularly basic. They have an uh, extra ammonia group. Uh, histidine is also a basic amino acid. And then arginine and histidine are particularly important during periods of growth. Arginine and lysine are important for nuclear localization signals. And then arginine and lysine together are uh, also found in high concentrations in histones. Now, because of their positive uh, uh, basic charge, they can interact with the negatively charged DNA. And then your acidic amino acids are aspartate and glutamate. And that's kind of easy to remember because they're also referred to as aspartic acid and glutamic acid. Uh, so they're negatively charged uh, at the body pH, whereas the basic amino acids tend to be positively charged. Now, the one exception to this rule is that histidine, although it's considered a basic amino acid, actually has no charge at body pH. So now let's talk about some of the derivatives of amino acids. What are some of the interesting compounds uh, your body can make with these amino acids? Now, this is a five-star topic, unfortunately. Uh, you're going to have a question about amino acid derivatives. Now, phenylalanine plays an important role in catecholamine synthesis. Now, the amino acid phenylalanine is essential for the generation of tyrosine. And then tyrosine is found in high concentrations uh, in thyroglobulin, and then you can actually iodinate uh, those tyrosine residues to make thyroxine, so your thyroid hormone, really important thing. Now tyrosine can also be converted to dopa, and dopa can be converted into melanin. Uh, and where in your brain might you have a high level of melanin because of high concentrations of dopa and dopamine? Well, that would be the substantia nigra, which is uh, potentially damaged in patients with Parkinson's disease. Now, they lose the dopaminergic uh, cells, so they don't make dopamine and they don't make melanin in that substantia nigra. Another disease related to this is albinism. If patients can't convert dopa to melanin, then that results in that albinism. Now, dopa is converted to dopamine, dopamine to norepinephrine, and then norepinephrine to epinephrine. So what are the enzymes that catalyze this conversion of phenylalanine to epinephrine? 
Well, phenylalanine to tyrosine is accomplished by phenylalanine hydroxylase. And if you're deficient in that enzyme, you get something called PKU. And we'll talk about that in detail in our next video. Now, not only is phenylalanine hydroxylase needed, but also the tetrahydrobiopterin, uh, which is required when converting phenylalanine to tyrosine. Again, we'll talk about that uh, later on. Now, tyrosine goes to DOPA by tyrosine hydroxylase. And then the third enzyme of this pathway that I want you to know is DOPA decarboxylase. And that converts DOPA to dopamine. And that particular enzyme, DOPA decarboxylase, is inhibited by carbidopa, uh, which is a medication we use to treat Parkinson disease. Now, dopamine is converted to norepinephrine. You don't really need to know uh, that enzyme. And then norepinephrine is converted to epinephrine. And cortisol is actually going to facilitate that process, that conversion of norepinephrine to epinephrine. So it makes sense that the stress hormone cortisol would facilitate the generation of that fight or flight hormone epinephrine. Now, what happens when you break these things down? Well, dopamine gets broken down by the enzymes monoamine oxidase and catechol O methyltransferase, and that's going to finally leave you with HVA. Now, norepinephrine gets broken down into VMA and epinephrine into metanephrine. All right, so that all started with phenylalanine. Now, what can you make out of some of the other amino acids? Well, arginine uh, is used to make three different important compounds. It can be used to make creatine, uh, which is a high-energy phosphate carrier that can replenish ATP. So it can transfer its phosphate group to ATP. So when ATP starts to run out, you have this kind of backup energy metabolite of creatine phosphate that's going to rapidly phosphorylate that ADP back into ATP. Now, arginine is also important for the generation of urea, which we'll talk about more in just a minute. And then arginine can be converted to nitric oxide as well. And nitric oxide is, as you probably know, a smooth muscle relaxer, and it's very essential in vasodilation. All right, so then let's talk about several amino acid derivatives that are dependent upon vitamin B6 as a cofactor. So first we have tryptophan. Tryptophan is converted to niacin, which is particularly important uh, in the body in the generation of NAD and NADP. Now these are essential in oxidation and reduction reactions. Tryptophan is also essential for the generation of serotonin, which is a precursor to melatonin. Now which gland of your body makes melatonin? Remember that's the pineal gland. Now histidine uh, is another one. It can be converted to histamine. And again, you need vitamin B6 for that reaction. Now, B6 is also needed for the conversion of glycine to porphyrin, and porphyrin is converted to heme. Now, the rate-limiting enzyme for heme synthesis is uh, aminolevulinic synthase. And the amino acid glutamate is essential for the production of GABA. And again, uh, that's with the help of vitamin B6. So, and GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter of the central nervous system. So with B6 deficiency, uh, you're not going to have as much GABA around. That can result in a lack of inhibition, which may actually lead to seizures. And then also glutamate is important for the generation of glutathione, and glutathione is an important antioxidant. We'll talk about that one in a later lecture as well. All right, so now it's time for the urea cycle. So we use amino acids to make all those substances that we just mentioned, and of course we put amino acids together to make enzymes and receptors and proteins and lots of other complex molecules. But whenever you break down amino acids, there has to be a mechanism to get rid of all that nitrogen or it's going to build up. So yes, it's time to talk about that urea cycle, uh, and it's not much fun, but you got to learn it. So the urea uh, cycle is going to take place in the liver. And first of all, you need to know what urea looks like. It is a, a, a compound you need to know. It is a carbon molecule with a double-bounded oxygen and then NH2 on either side of that carbon. Now, the rate-limiting enzyme for the urea cycle is carbamoyl phosphate synthetase 1, and it's actually found in the mitochondria. And that might actually sound familiar because carbamoyl phosphate synthetase 2 uh, was the rate limiter for pyrimidine synthesis. So again, just to contrast with that CPS1, it's used in the urea cycle. It's found in the mitochondria, and it gets its nitrogen from ammonium. CPS2 is used in pyrimidine synthesis, and it's found in the cytosol. It gets its nitrogen from glutamine, so be aware of those differences there. Now, I don't think you need to get too bogged down in all the different enzymes and all the different substrates of everything in the urea cycle. I would certainly know CPS1 and the mitochondria as the major rate limiter. I would also know one other enzyme, ornithine transcarbamylase, and this is another very important enzyme in the urea cycle. Uh, and speaking of which, let's talk about a deficiency in this enzyme. So what happens if you're deficient in ornithine transcarbamylase? 
Well, that is the most common uh, urea cycle disorder, and it is an X-linked recessive disorder. And if you don't have that enzyme, then you can't undergo the urea cycle, obviously. You're going to build up a lot of nitrogen, a lot of ammonia in your body. And this is particularly problematic, and it becomes evident in even the, just the first few days of life. All this excess uh, carbon oil phosphate is converted to orotic acid. So you find orotic acid uh, in the blood and in the urine. Uh, also, your blood urea nitrogen is going to be decreased because your urea cycle uh, is not working, so you can't actually make urea. So BUN uh, is an indicator that the uh, urea cycle is actually working. If it's elevated, then you're probably making urea, but maybe you're not excreting it uh, by the kidneys. If BUN is decreased, as I just said, it may be that you're not actually producing this urea cycle. So, with ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency, you're going to have symptoms of uh, hyperammonemia, so elevated ammonia levels. Now, you can have elevated ammonia levels either from a particular uh, urea cycle enzyme deficiency, like we just talked about, or because the cell responsible for the urea uh, cycle is damaged. So, what's that? The hepatocyte. So, liver disease can certainly cause a hyperammonemia as well. So, what are the symptoms of this? Well, patients will have slurring of the speech, they'll have somnolence, they'll have vomiting, uh, potentially cerebral edema even, uh, blurring of the vision. Now, we refer to, to this constellation of symptoms as hepatoencephalopathy. Cephalopathy. So again, you can see this with liver disease or if you have, in this case, a urea enzyme deficiency. And again, the most common urea enzyme deficiency is the ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. So how do we treat this? Well, since this is a nitrogen processing problem, then we try to decrease uh, um, the actual nitrogen load. And you can do this by eating a very low protein diet, so you're not breaking all those amino acids down. Now, if it's a urea cycle problem, then you can use a couple different things. There's a phenobutyrate, which actually binds certain amino acids like glycine and glutamine. Uh, it can help excrete these amino acids. Uh, benzoate is another medication that can be used uh, that helps excrete some of these amino acids. Biotin uh, can also be helpful because it can actually stimulate ornithine transcarbamylase. All right, guys, that brings us to the end of this lecture. It's time for that end of session quiz. So let's go through those answers together. All right, first question here, uh, what are the essential amino acids? Remember our mnemonic private Tim Hall. So first we have phenylalanine, we have valine, tryptophan, threonine, isoleucine, methionine, histidine, leucine, and lysine. So those are the essential uh, amino acids. You have to eat those up. Next, what amino acid is a precursor for the following molecule? So first we have histamine, uh, the precursor is histidine. Porphyrin and heme, remember the precursor is glycine. Nitric oxide, remember the precursor is arginine. The neurotransmitter GABA, remember that precursor is going to be glutamate. s methionine, the precursor is just plain old methionine. And the pre precursor of creatine is going to be arginine. Next question, compare CPS1 to CPS2. So remember that uh, CPS1 is part of the urea cycle. Remember, that's the part that takes place in the mitochondria. It's going to get its nitrogen from ammonia. Uh, for CPS2, it's going to be involved in a pyrimidine synthesis. It's found in the cytosol, so a different place, and it gets its nitrogen from glutamine. All right, guys, that brings us to the end of the end of session quiz. That's the end of Biochem 14. I hope you learned something. I'll see you next time.